Hi, it's Dr. Nick with the ECG Academy, and this week's Chalk Talk is a fairly basic 12 lead. Now, if you've gone through all the lessons and you've seen many, many 12 leads before, you realize that after a while, things sort of pop off the page. I always tell people, look at the whole entire forest first before you start concentrating on the trees. And when you look at this whole entire 12 lead, in my mind, one thing does pop off the page, and that is here in V1, V2, V3, you've got this very large upright deflection and you have an RSR prime pattern. Look how nice that is in V3. And here in V1, it's sort of a little R and then the R prime kind of goes high. Same thing in V2. So this is consistent with a right bundle branch block. And that's, you know, like right away, you can identify this as being one of the major problems with this cardiogram. Now, along with the rabbit ears or RSR prime in V1, V2, V3 in a right bundle branch block, you expect to see a wide S wave in the lateral leads, right? Why is that? Because in a right bundle branch block, the AV node passes the signal down to the His bundle and the right bundle is not working. So the signal has to go down the left bundle, activate the left ventricle normally, but then the right ventricle has to depolarize very slowly through intramyocardial sort of cell to cell connections. And so you get this late signal that's headed towards the right side away from the lateral leads, one AVL, V5, and V6. So that's why you get this negative deflection, this S wave, and it's a little wide because it's taking a long time to get around the right ventricle. You can see it here in V6 again. So you have this really tall, narrow R wave, and then the S wave is wide. And that's typical for right bundle branch block. Anyway, so you make a list of findings, and then at the end, you kind of like pull it all together. Okay, if we're going to look at the precordial leads and notice that right bundle branch block, we'll also see that the R wave progresses pretty nicely. You get the nice tall R wave here. And remember that that T waves tend to deviate in the opposite direction from the bundle branch block. We call the secondary T wave abnormalities, and that explains why you get this sort of ST depression and inverted T waves when that R prime is pointed upwards. But you still have a little bit of residual ST depression only maybe, you know, a half a millimeter or maybe a millimeter or so. So that's something to notice as well. But now let's kind of go back to the beginning and start to analyze all the normal things that we look at in a 12 lead. For example, the rhythm. We can see P waves in front of every QRS complex. And those P waves are up in 1, 2 and AVF. So it's going down and towards the patient's left. And we can count off the rate here at 300, 150, 100. So the rate's a little bit less than 100, maybe around 90 beats a minute. But we'll still call this a normal sinus rhythm. Now, what about the intervals? We can zoom in a little bit. And if you want, you can take a pair of calipers to the PR interval, bring it down to the beginning of the P wave, to the beginning of the QRS complex. And then we can move it to the grid and we can see the PR interval is just about 200 milliseconds. So it's normal, but it's on the long side of normal. We can see the QRS duration pretty easily here in V2, at least three small boxes. We can probably call this 130 milliseconds since it's going a little bit past the third box box and the QT interval is just about 400 milliseconds. Using Bazet's formula, right, the QTC is equal to the QT, which is 400, divided by the square root of the R to R interval in seconds. Let's see how many milliseconds we have. It's 200, 400, 600, maybe another 50. So we'll call it 0 0.65, which is 650 milliseconds. Grab our calculator, make it 400 divided by the square root of 0 0.65, and that equals 496. So look at that. The QT interval is a little bit long. Now, you might expect the QT interval to be slightly prolonged because of the presence of this right bundle branch block. We generally get to be a little concerned when the T wave goes past the midpoint between the two QRS complex and it's right at that point. So I would say there's a borderline prolonged QT interval. All right, next thing to look at is the axis. Look for which lead is most isoelectric and it looks like it's AVR. Now, AVR should never be isoelectric under normal circumstances because AVR is kind of pointed in this direction, which is 30 degrees above lead one headed towards the right arm. And that means that the axis is either minus 60 or it's plus 120. Now, if you look at leads two, three and F, they're negative. So that means the axis is going away from the feet. And that means that minus 60 
is the correct axis. And the first thing you want to do is make sure you're not dealing with an old inferior MI, because if you have an old inferior MI and the underside of the heart is not working, you have no electrical activity in the inferior wall, then the axis will tend to shift upwards towards the left. But we do not have Q waves in the inferior leads. 2, 3, and AVF have little tiny R waves. You see that? And there's a clear R wave in lead two. So it's not an old inferior MI, and therefore it must be left anterior hemi block or left anterior fascicular block. So that taken together with the right bundle branch block, and you have to call this a bifascicular block. All right, otherwise the STs look okay. There's no pathological Q waves any place. And so to kind of pull this all together, basically you're dealing with a normal sinus rhythm with a right bundle branch block and a left anterior hemi block. There's also a borderline prolonged QT interval and those nonspecific STT wave abnormalities. I guess there's one last thing that you might notice is that the P wave in V1, it has a biphasic appearance with initial positive phase and then a big negative phase. And the negative part of the P wave is about one box wide and about one box deep. So you might consider okay, left atrial abnormality or left atrial enlargement. Okay, so again, things will sometimes pop off the page. You'll see them right away, but then always go back and take the whole entire tracing step by step, looking at the rhythm and the intervals and the axis and so on, so that you don't miss anything. I hope this was a helpful exercise for you guys. This is a basic 12 lead. There's lots of things wrong with it, but this is the kind of stuff you'll see every day when you're reading ECGs. So until next time, this is Dr. Nick with the ECG Academy. Thanks for watching.